Hi, everybody. Welcome to Equipando Padres Academy. My name is Rose Martinez. I'm joining you from Denver, Colorado, where we have about four inches of snow all over <laughs> tonight. So I hope you guys are um, staying warm uh, wherever you may be. But um, I am a ship staff member. Um, I work on the Equipando Padres team. So I'm really happy to be here with you guys tonight. Um, if you have any ship specific questions, feel free to reach out. Um, there'll be some contact information in the slides as we go along, but wanted to make sure you guys, um, that I introduce myself to everybody. And without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it over to our host for the night. Thank you, Rose. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, I know this is, it's a little late and some of us are dealing with snow and some of us are dealing with humidity and, and 90 degree weather. So different problems. Um, so tonight, tonight is uh, the third module where we're going to really, we what we did is we took two modules and putting them together and it's called preparing for college visits and applying for college. But before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and ask our, our, we have quite a few volunteers and parents in here. If you want to introduce yourself on the chat, go ahead and plug in um, who you are, your name and where, where you visit us from as I do this. So my name is Dr. Jose Antonio Herrera. I am in Houston, Texas, currently at the uh, at this time. Um, this is, I've been working with Equipando Padres for a couple of years now. If, you, if you've been in other modules, this is gonna be a repeat. Uh, the reason I, I'm actually a first generation college for myself. And the reason I really got involved is the mission of, of SHIP really aligned to mind. What ended up happening is, as you can see, those three pictures right there is my my three kids who are not really kids; they're adults now. Um, two of them actually. One of the my daughter, the top one, she's actually working on her master's. The one on the left, he's a senior at University of Houston, and the little one, though he looks little there, he's actually going through the same process of applying for college right now. He's about to be eighteen; it's his senior year. So I understand the journey as a parent that you're going through right now. And more importantly, I really thought that it was going to be quite easier for me than for my parents, just because I had gone through college and what I've learned through the process, it's it's quite, there's so many hoops to jump through and things have changed. So what I'm hoping here in, these, in this time we have together that hopefully you can get a little bit of information and some support. And if nothing else, like we can lean on each other because our babies are leaving home and going to college. So. All right, so why we are here today. The, the reason for being is to provide parents and caregivers of first-generation college students. Obviously, if you're not first-generation college, you're still welcome. And what, I, what we hope is that you get three, three different buckets of information. One is obviously the knowledge of the in, the, in, the, in the modules that we're working on, tools and resources. And furthermore, more specific, if you're going into a STEM career, that support. Uh, many of our volunteers that are here tonight, they're actually in the field. They're either engineers or in the STEM careers, and they've walked the walk, and they're actually already, they have a wealth of knowledge, and they can definitely provide some of that support on STEM. Uh, STEM is an acronym that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. It's an umbrella of careers. So how we plan to reach our goals, um, we do definitely do want to incorporate the cultural aspects of our identity and how that reflects in the in where we go to college, addressing the challenges that come with actually attending college and getting there and getting through college and posi positioning families. I know myself, I sometimes I wonder like where, what is my role? I am a parent, I am a dad. To what extent do I need support and how do I contribute to my child's success? So the, hopefully contributing to your own child's success. Many of you, if this is uh, this is a, a second or third module for you, you already have the guidebook. If not, we make sure uh, we will make sure to get it to you as you registered. If you look at the pages right there, if you are following with the guidebook, and I'm thinking they're going to they're going to drop the digital version in the chat. We're going to start at page 41. So if you want to follow along, we will be starting at page 41. The guidebook is in Spanish on one side and English on the other side. There's a bilingual guidebook. All right, so let's start with the first topic, 
preparing for college visits. So if you remember from the last time, actually, before we get into it, let me start with a uh, question for the group. Why is it important to visit universities? Again, why, for, why do you think as a parent or a caregiver, you think it's important to visit the universities? And go ahead and think about it, drop it in the chat or open the mic. I'm gonna go ahead and call on Cassandra on um, why you think it's important to visit universities, Cassandra. So yeah, so whenever I was used picking universities, um, I was kind of, I would, didn't want to settle for just being like five minutes away from home. Um, so one of the schools, the school I'm currently attending was Texas Tech that I had in mind. Um, that's nine hours away from Houston where I, I, that's where I was born and raised. So visiting the school to my parents was specifically important because they wanted to know what was around, what was in the area, what in terms of safety, in terms of uh, if I needed help, who could I reach out to, who is the closest to me, um, what what all do I have in school, what all is around the school. Um, so that was very important to them. And it's something that, you know, a lot of people don't consider, but it's also like, will I fit in and will I feel at home? Um, I think that was important to my parents so that they have a peace of mind to say, hey, She's at school, she's safe. Um, so that was really, really important to them and to me in the long run as well. Awesome, thanks for sharing, Cassandra. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a you bring up some excellent points. As well in the chat, I saw that Efrain said that safety protocols, honestly, with everything going on, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, partially in watching the news, that's one of my biggest fears I know with my own children, like, are they safe? Um, and then the child fits, Fernando and Andres del Cerro, uh, say child fits, cultural, race, weather, um, and the major. And these are all topics we're definitely going to talk about today. So thank you for sharing. Um, I I agree with you 100%. In the last module, we definitely talked about uh, the fit, uh, the different type of colleges, uh, whether it be um, a big university or small university. So I, I agree with you 100% that it's all about fit. So having said that, oh, sorry, y'all. It took me too fast. Um, last module, we, we, uh, we introduced the Tepos family. In this scenario, we had um, the young lady who was actually going to attend college. And for, this, for the purposes of this module and getting started with the process, I think where we want to begin is definitely when you're talking about visiting colleges is contact the campus offices for tours and get information. Do they have an open house day? Do they have a private tours? And when you do contact uh, contact them, make sure you have the needs like outline what are the needs. I think I saw in the chat that um, some of the majors. So if you're trying to be uh, an industrial engineer, do you have carry that program or whatever the engineering uh, aspect it would be or whatever degree you're looking for, making sure that they, it's not only that they have it, but also they have the, the accreditation for it. These are some, some of the things to remember is, uh, are you going to be out of state? Are you going to be in state? Are you going to be close to home? Where are you going to live? Um, are you going to stay at the dorms? Like I said, industrial engineering, is it, do they have the degree that you're looking for? Safety, safety protocols. Um, what about tuition? What about the financials? Uh, the club. So all these things are something, some of the things that you really have to think of a big umbrella of, of things that you need to discuss when you do visit college. Um, and then obviously with that, uh, one of the things that I loved about um, Equipando Padres was the, the resources. Um, I think it's very challenging at times for us to organize uh, the different areas of, that we think through. So in this in this case, and then let me go ahead and share it since I have it here. They do have a budget template that will be there that's available to you. Let me sure I get it right. And it kind of looks like this. So when you're deciding to visit a college, it's it would be very smart to go ahead and get this form right here and go through that checklist of okay. If you can see on the right side, you have 
the travel, the on-site transportation, where you're going to stay, dining, on-campus events. Sometimes, at times, they have the games, they have concerts, all this. That way, hopefully, if you see right here, you can create a budget for what it's going to cost to visit that campus. And then I love the little checklist that it has on the left side right here. If you can see with the information on how to, on what to book. And on the back side of it, if you print, print it double-sided, it has a place for notes. So I think this is a wonderful tool to include when you're actually looking at the option of visiting a campus. Sorry, y'all, let me get this going. So I really encourage you to use that. Um, so as we were saying, when we're going through the budget template, these are some of the things that you want to consider when you're looking at college visits. Um, when we're talking about fit, I know one of our uh, participants talked about fit. I would really encourage you to look at the at the the bottom bullet point where free adventures. Like, what is it when you're? I mean, if if we remember, if we all of us have been through college, like usually it's time where money's not easily accessible. So, what are we gonna do? I know for me, I was a rec center when I was in college. I pretty much lived there if I wasn't in class. So, what is it we're gonna do? Uh, are they parks? Are they museums? What is but you really want to get that feeling what uh, that campus life feels like to get a sense of the fit. And as you do this, along with that, uh, there's also a college visit scorecard. And actually, you know what? Let me go ahead and share that too. So again, I think it's a wonderful tool that really puts it in perspective uh, of how to rate it. And it's, I like that you can get any every college that you visit, it has your little checklist and what to do pre-plan before the campus visit, during the campus visit. And this right here, I think it's something that's something that many times we forget, but I think something that's crucial, especially if you can talk to the admissions reps, you can talk to the people that are involved in the college of the degree you want to do. Sometimes just making sure that they remember your name and sending that thank you, it's very important. And I love, love, love all this information right here because I think when you look at ranking criteria, when we're talking about is it a good fit for my child, this area right here is sometimes when we actually go and visit, whether it be a virtual tour in person, it's a little different. So here I recommend you all put a rating as you go through it, zero to five, zero being not applicable, one being poor, all the way to five. And that gives you an objective way to really view this if that's your thing. So I think it's a pretty good tool to incorporate in your college visits. All right. And these, this is a, just a brief example of some of the things that we saw in the actual tool. In this case, is using a scenario for the Temples family where it looked at uh, UC Davis, University of Houston, and uh, how was the academic quality, campus environment, and you can objectively look at a comparison there. Um, in this case, we were talking about industrial engineering. So you have University of Houston, who has an industrial engineering program, and UC Davis, who in this case, I believe this scenario didn't have it. Don't take my word for it. They might have it. Um, but but for the sake of the scenario, that's what we have right there. And as you can see, it give, really gives you an objective view of it. And then finally, uh, the cost. I know that's a very big piece for many of us of where we determine where we go. And the scorecard can really help you put that into perspective. So as you get to the tour, um, and I, I, one of the, funny enough, I was talking to my daughter who's uh, an admissions rep at university. I was like, well, what, what is um, one of the things that you recommend that's most important for students to do when they're trying to get into college. She said, really talk to those admission folks because ultimately they're the ones that are going to get to know you. And the more questions you ask, the more intrigued you are, not only is it going to help you as a, as a student understand if you're the right fit, but it's also going to go ahead and put you in mind for them of like, uh, or, or vice versa, if you're a good fit there. So I think ultimately when you visit this college, it's definitely an interview both ways of, of uh, placement and fit. So I, I highly recommend to ask some questions like these right here 
uh, when you when you go to the college visit. And if you remember that tool that I just showed you, these are some questions that you could definitely write ahead of time there. And that way you're ready to roll when you actually go on the college visit. Usually during your visit, this is kind of the the four areas that you'll have. You'll usually have a you start with an info session. Um, if you're going to one of the predetermined uh, dates that they have, you'll start with the info session, then they'll break it down into a facility tour. Then it's important to make sure you have your questions ready and get those contacts. So again, using that tool will really, really uh, organize it for you. That way you get all the information there. After you visit, make sure you document all your scorecard, compare the universities, and then just like I said, don't forget to follow up with the with the thank yous uh, for the staff. And finally, remember that you and your student are you are a team, so make sure that as you go through this, you keep in mind that the ultimate goal make sure making sure we find the, find the right fit and work together. There is a college ranking tool that um, Equipando Padres has, and I believe they, they dropped the links in the chat. Um, so I would encourage you to explore this, this tool and see if it's something that you want to incorporate as well with the other tools. So I want to go ahead and bring in our panel. So I'm going to go ahead and call and introduce, I believe, I definitely saw that we have Cassandra here. And Cassandra, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself. Speak a little bit about who you are. Yeah, hi everyone. So my name is Cassandra Perales. Um, I am currently a senior at Texas Tech University. Um, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. So it was a bit of a drive for me uh, to move up for college. It's about a nine hour drive. Um, I am set to graduate in August of 2025, and hopefully I'll be starting full time with Boston Scientific. Um, you can see on my on my little QR like symbols. I also have the HCC symbol, so dual credit is something that I did during high school. So I was able to graduate graduate with my associates um, from HCC before I graduated from high school. Uh, so I was able to come into college with a couple of extra credits. Um, and then I'm currently involved with CHEF by being the internal vice president at our current chapter here at Texas Tech. Um, so I'm involved with getting our Equipando Padres and our CHEF Junior uh, stuff going here at Texas Tech. And then also with our socials and planning and just making sure that we create our community here at Texas Tech. Thank you, Cassandra. And Jocelyn, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, um, my name is Jocelyn Mata. I am a geophysics and computer science major at Cal State University Northridge. Um, a little bit about myself is that um, I have a learning disorder. And so I don't, I guess I don't find that being an obstacle, but I'm a very big uh, advocate on students with disabilities because I myself am one. Um, and so I kind of spend most of my time advocating with other students about, you know, other STEM resources. That's what I do on campus. And then also I'm currently a Girls Who Code fellow where we empower more women to go into tech fields and inspiring them and teaching them how to code in their submits. And right now what I'm currently doing in SHIP is being a facility, oh, one of Equipando Padres um, volunteership facilitators. And I'm also a student um, rep in my student chapter and sharing um, more resources in SHIP and also sharing other STEM resources to them as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Um, let me start with a quick question for you. Uh, parents, and I, I'm going to go ahead and open it after this question to you. So if you have any questions for our panelists, um, they are wealth information. They are going through the journey that many of your, your children are going to go through here pretty soon. So have those questions ready. Um, I guess my first question to y'all is, um, how did you decide to dedicate yourself to that area of study? How did you get there? I see, I mean, those are Pretty, pretty intense geophysics and computer science and mechanical engineering. So how did how did you arrive? Is that something you always determine? How did you, what 
what resources you see, who did you talk to to get there? And go ahead and open the mic when you're ready. I can go first. Um, so I chose mechanical engineering because I knew that I was good at math and science. I knew that I, um, I had always been told in high school that that should be a field that I should consider. Um, I didn't know what industry specifically I wanted to go into. So um, I spoke to some of the college advisors, uh, were at, like looked over websites and also spoke at uh, just some relatives that I have, some extended relatives to ask what they recommended. I know mechanical engineering is a pretty broad field that you can go into pretty much any industry. So to keep my options open before I decided to pick an industry, I decided to make go into that major to hopefully once I was in there, once I got my foot in the door, I could go in different directions. Um, to me, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily that I was going to do specifically mechanical engineering. It was where can that take me? Um, so the broader the field to me was more options at, uh, at the end of the day. And for, oh, can I go next? Oh, yeah. Um, for me, it was more of, um, I was, well, yeah, I was deprived from STEM opportunities when I was younger. I wanted to be a part of like the robotics, um, the app academy growing up, and I couldn't really do that. So when I got to college, I kind of really felt the need to um, try to explore that out and ship in uh, Girls Who Code and SWE, Society of Women Engineers. I was seeing that they were doing um, workshops on like 3D printing, coding, and like get to learn more about like what ship was and so for me um my biggest exposure was yeah when I was little but I was deprived from that because of my learning disorder because my counselor thought that I wasn't I guess yet alone go to college but um be able to I guess surpass like even high school because of the the learning stages that I was in um classes wise special education and so I felt that like when I got to Northridge me exploring that further and being a part of the orgs that I, that's how I got to know what I know now in my major. And I feel like that is a good way to, I guess, I guess I also highlight this, um, encourage people to join, you know, Noche de Ciencias that ship does too, because I feel like it kind of exposes your child to see more than just what the major is, I feel. Great, great, great advice. Um, at this point, I will open it up to any of our parents. Feel free to open your mic if you have any questions. If not, I will continue asking. Hi. Do you Hi. recommend, um, I have twin boys, and they've been applying, they've been told since they have free application or, 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 or free fee that they should apply to thousands of them and I told them I just want you to focus on three and just focus on three um do you think that's a good decision or do you think they should just apply to apply I can take this one um personally whenever I was applying when I was going through the process of applying to colleges I know that some of the schools do require fees and have to like require the fee to even apply um, because I was a low income student, I was able to get the waiver. Uh, I was able to get the waiver so that fee was waived. Um, I, I think that to me was like an open door of, I'm just going to apply to see what opportunities are out there. If you're, if your boys have the, op the option of like, they don't have the waiver, they like the cost restriction isn't a problem for them. I would apply because at the end of the day, you don't know what, what is all is out there. Like, for example, Texas Tech, whenever I was applying, they didn't accept the waiver, um, but my dad encouraged me to pay. He was like, I'll pay for it. Don't even worry about it. Just apply. Let's see what happens. Um, I didn't even think I was going to pick Texas Tech. Um, to me, it was like, a, oh, I'm just I'm going to do it to see what all is out there. I would still apply. Um, again, at the end of the day, like for me, I changed my mind last minute. I went from, oh, I'm going to go to A&M and be an Aggie to I'm going to go to Texas Tech. So you never know what, at the end of the day, what you could change, what decisions you make. It's also really cool to get all the letters of like, oh, I'm well, in, and you get all the like, all the packets. So it's really cool. 
Do you have anything to add with that one, Jocelyn? Yeah, I do. Um, to also add, um, some of these um universities, what I've noticed is that they do a prep summer, I guess summer of their junior or as a senior year or something like that. I've been looking into that where um they have summer programs where they can help you uh, you know prepare for the application and they also if you go through the prep college prep programs i'm not sure like some to name a few i guess like trio or something like that or like as other schools they have like this like early start to prepare for college and they offer like um waivers for the schools that you're applying to or interested or you can also even attend an info session and for just attending an info session of that university um you can also end up potentially getting a free voucher code for it as well something else that i do want to add and i completely went by it um it's also really good to apply like to write to a variety of schools because different schools offer different amounts of financial aid so if financial aid is something that you're considering and keeping in mind, um, I, for example, was able to compare how much different universities were offering me, and I was able to go off of that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then I had a, a, a question. It was a direct question actually on the chat about admissions reps and how, how much, to what extent do you feel that it is... Uh, important and if they're really being um, transparent and if they're trying to be a good fit or they're just trying to meet a quota. Um, I think it's important to just keep in mind, like like everything else, it's overwhelming as a parent. Like I know right now with my, my child being a senior, every day in the mail, it stacks and stacks of different universities, sending postcards, sending little gifts, sending, especially after they take those SATs, ACTs, you get all that. So it, it really just depends on the institution. But at the end of the day, I think that's why important it's so important as uh, Jocelyn and Cassandra are saying to do your research and know which institution you're going to and what what really, what the backwards is designed. By that, I mean, like, where do you want to get to? What degree? And then from there, what's going to be the best fit, fit for that? So as you do that, um, obviously, you're probably going to talk to many admissions reps, but it's better than for for them to know you just in case that is the right fit for you. Excellent. Any other parents that have a question? Feel free to open your mic. Okay, here's a question from me for Cassandra and Jocelyn. What's your advice to parents of first generation students when it comes to applying to college? What advice do you have for them? I would say um, when I was in the process of well, going to college, I guess you could say, um, at first I didn't want to consider community college because I was like, you know, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, my heart is set on, you know, four year, right? But then also the possibility that it could be that like financial burden or, you know, sometimes you have to pivot and it's okay to pivot. And that's one thing that I've noticed that like, I was at the four year, I pivot to the community college and I was realizing like, wow, um, community college does offer a lot of opportunities. And like, you can, I guess for a lesser cost, I guess to also consider the possibility of maybe going to community college, but then also looking into um, other schools, go to, I guess, visit college day, or I don't know, I guess that's what some of the colleges here in California, that's what they call it. Some like visit the college, they do tours. So to, you know, go with your child to, you know, explore that. Also try to ask if they can meet with like, you know, a student that's currently, you know, in that field or someone that they could connect you with in order to see like if it's, you know, if the major, because you got to look at all aspects. So I, how my mom and I did it was we had to look at the major. We had to look at the cost of financial aid. We had to look at the cost of like, how much would it be for me to dorm there or to commute there? We had to consider the fact also of um, if I was going to be able to still get the disability resources. And it's a lot to count of, you know, to make to making sure like that school is like best fit in the sense of all aspects you got to make sure like you know creating a list making sure that like that list checks all the boxes and 
I even tell my cousin that's, that's like 15 years old, like it's never too late to start like looking into colleges because the more you start looking at an earlier time, I feel like um the chances, you know, you start thinking ahead, you start creating a list, you start like, you know, okay, they don't have this major, but they have this. Or, you know, you start looking into programs that could best suit your needs and, and interests of exploring if that college is for you or not. And to add on to what Jocelyn was saying, um, me personally, I so let me take a step back. I also used to work for the first gen department at Texas Tech. So I was a lead student assistant. I used to see firsthand how much, how drastic of a change it is to students to go from high school to a four-year university. The best advice that I, like, I've seen, not only my parents do for me, but I've seen other parents do for their own students, is to support them. Um, support them remind them that you're, they're not alone that it's okay to be scared it's okay to not know what the heck not know what the next step is but they're not alone um whenever I chose to come to Texas Tech I keep saying it, it's nine hours away the decision wasn't easy for me to make but they were offering me the most financial aid and me personally I didn't have the money in my savings account to just come to a four year university. To me, it was which school at the end of the day is going to offer me the most money. Um, whenever I chose tech, my parents were like, we support you all the way. We're not going to stop you. You know, if you want to fly, we're going to help you fly. Um, but one thing that my parents did tell me, they were like, but you're not going to give up. You're not going to go to tech and you're not going to say, be a semester in and say, oh, I want to come home. You're going to get homesick. You're going to get scared. You're going to, you're going to be lost. You're going to feel exhausted, but you're not going to give up. My mom said, I don't care if it takes you a hundred years. You're not coming back until you get that degree. And so I think just that reminder in the back of my head of my parents saying, Hey, it's, it's not going to be easy because if it were easy, everyone would do it, but you're not alone. Um, you're not going to go and say, I'm going to set my mind to this and then give up halfway through it. They were like, you're going to do it or you're not going to do it at all. So just keeping in mind that my parents have my back and, you know, I've had that phone call with my parents of like, mom, I just bombed an exam. I don't know what I'm going to do if I fail. And to her, it was, we take it. There is next semester, there's the next exam, there's always tomorrow. So keeping that in mind and just knowing that my parents support me all the way is the best advice I could give any other parent. Um, yes, it is a scary journey because college is scary, but know that they're taking a leap for the better. Um, and I, I can't speak for that enough. Cassandra, I love it. Um, and I guess I'll add a little bit to that. I know the first module, we kind of talk about this. And I think ultimately now having put through my, two of my own children through college and myself having been a first generation, my biggest advice is what Cassandra is saying that she feels as a, as a, as a child is that having that support, knowing I knew for me, um, me when personally, when I was actually going through college, um, it was, I always knew that my parents could not actually help me with any of the schoolwork or understand college. But if I felt, um, alone, I could go home and get some frijoles with queso and some tortillas. And I was going to, they were, my, it was always there. They were there to support me and, um, no judgment, just kind of there, the relationship changes. And with my own children, I know, um, we we made it a, a thing, whether it was Taco Tuesday, sometimes they would even virtual Taco Tuesday, where because they, they would do it on Zoom. And just them knowing that I'm that I'm proud of them, no matter if they bomb that test, they're gonna be okay. Uh, no matter if it takes a hundred years, like Cassandra said, you'll get through it. Um so so definitely, definitely keep that in mind as a parent. Keep the perspective that that you be their rock, you be there for them. So great chat. Uh, I'm going to, oh, again, pause, open up to any parents if you have any questions before I move on to, I don't want to take all the questions here. One of the parents asked me uh, to repeat why I chose mechanical engineering. Um, huh? So for that parent, um, so really I chose mechanical engineering because it's such a broad field. Um, I think that whenever you're unsure of which industry you want to go into specifically, choosing a field or a major that has so many aspects to go into is a great choice. For example, I chose mechanical engineering and I'm going into med device. 
one of my friends is also mechanical engineering and she's going into automotive. So keeping that, if you're not too sure which one specifically you want to go into, maybe picking a broader field and then going into industry like that. Um, I could have chosen to major in medical device or biomedical, but I knew that I wasn't too sure if that's exactly what I wanted to do. So picking a broader field to me was important, um, but I chose engineering specifically because I knew I always wanted to help. Um, I knew that I always I was good at math and science. I was good at being thinking outside the box. So I chose engineering for that reason. But yes, if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to ask. I have a question. Yes. Uh, it's for, thank you. It's for Cassandra. It's a little bit off topic, but she mentioned that she did her dual enrollment. She would, she received her AA. Uh, we hear this a lot. Um, some people say, yeah, you should get your AA. Some of them say just go straight to your bachelor's. So getting your AA for engineering, is it really beneficial or should you just go straight for bachelor's? I have two takes on this. I personally think that it helped me become and develop that works that work and study habits that I had. So I was able to develop of, okay, I need to study. I need to, how do I develop those skills early on? Um, however, I think the challenge that comes with this because you start those classes early, whenever you do get to a higher university, to a four year university, the transition is a lot harsher. So I went from a smaller course to a, like where we were about 20 students in Cal 1 to taking Cal 2 and it was a lecture hall of 40 students. So you can easily become overwhelmed with that, um, but it's not a bad experience. It's not something that's impossible. It's just a little bit more of a harsher transition versus if you start right away with your bachelor's, you start with the same group of people. So you start with Cal 1 with the same group of people. You're more than likely going to see, see those same people in Cal 2 and you grow with them um, versus if you right off the bat, you're a freshman going into Cal 2, like I was, it's sophomores and juniors who already have their groups and you have to hope that, you know, they like you enough to where you study with them. Um, and they're, they are, they're not, everybody's open to making friends in college, but um, I will say that transition is harsher. I don't regret getting my associates. I think that it's helped me build my resume a lot faster. And it also has helped me like I said, it helped me develop those study habits a lot sooner. So that transition of, you know, going from high school to college wasn't that harsh. But I will say the in terms of like levels of difficulty, there was a bit of a transition there. If that answered your question, Natalia. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. That's that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. And honestly, I think that goes hand in hand with all advice. Usually I've been doing this for a couple of years, like I said, and I never think that it's good or bad. Like it's always going to have pros and cons for everything. Kind of like what Cassandra said, there's some pros that she got with study habits, but there's some cons that she didn't build uh, her cohort, her community early earlier, but she still built it as, as she progressed. So that's something to keep in mind with, with, all uh, with all this uh, information when you're looking for your child, for your students, uh, what to do, the, really what are the pros and cons. Um, Natalia, did you have another question or somebody, another parent had another question? I, I, I do have a question for you. Um, and this is actually that something I do wonder because I, I'm, I struggle with this with when through the application process and supporting my own kids, how to how to make that. So how did you support your application? So when you actually applying to college, um, was it volunteer service, the jobs, projects, clubs? Uh, what is it? What is it that you added on as your extracurriculars, those extras that you really felt um, was impactful for your application? Um, oh, does it matter? Answers. Okay. Um, for me, it was mostly, um, I did track well in the spring and no, in the winter and the fall, I did basketball. And then in the spring, my mom had me in 
track all the way up into the summer. And so I guess sports, I was in sports and then community service wise, I was helping in hospitals, clinics, um, libraries, um, the animal shelter, the homeless shelter, um, different, I guess my mom had me doing different things, I guess, to explore, I guess, as a career and also like to keep me, I guess, motivated. And then after school programs where we would work on like, you know, start developing a list of colleges that we want to go to. So some high schools have like preparatory or like have some connections with like the community colleges, like also to add on to what Ro Rose was saying in the chat that like, Some schools have like preparatory programs that guarantee or help you, you know, in case you were going to a four year, you know, preparatory yourself to like think, you know, start taking AP classes, honors classes, or like visit a college where I think it was college upbound, where we would go every weekend and, um, well, here where I live, I guess you could say, um, we would go every weekend and we would, you know, do different activities and like start to like see what career paths. And so getting kids engaged in like what they're interested or like after school robotics or it's whether it's finding to see if they have a ship junior chapter, you know, that's always good to start, you know, getting into ship early. Um, There's other high school programs. Um, For me, it was just mostly like, I guess, volunteer work, community service, and sports for me, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I want to add on to what Jocelyn said. I think colleges want to see that you can be able to be, you're capable of being a well-rounded student. You know, oh, you, yes, you have a 4-point GPA, but what good is a 4-point GPA if you weren't involved in anything? Um, us, the colleges would much rather see someone who has not as much of a, like, obviously a 4-point is crazy for grade. Um, but if you have volunteer service, if you have community service, if you have, you know, those extracurriculars, those clubs that you're a part of, and also those leadership in those clubs um, also have a huge, uh, huge mark on your resume. So, for example, I was our uh, graduating class secretary. So, you know, you show early leadership and early leadership skills and you know, even if you're like, I was captain for the volleyball team um, and the softball team. So saying like, hey, I was captain for these teams and I was able to participate in those while also being a part of academic uh, projects. I think I was in the math, math catalan or whatever, whatever, however you pronounce it, um, you know, being a part of those, but just showing to the universities that you, you're capable of being a well-rounded student. Um, I'm you know, this was four years ago for me, but my sister is currently like applying and getting all of her stuff together. So I've seen it firsthand where she's like, well, how do I get these? Just showing to these universities that you're capable of being, you're yes, you're great at your academics, but you're also, also capable of being active in the community and active in the student body and, you know, um, being a team player at the end of the day. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Um, I did get a question in the chat directly about uh, dual enrollment and AP in high school. Uh, and first of all, I, any kind of advanced coursework always looks good on your on your application for the most part. Um, then it's also it depends also on the universities. I know for a fact my my two eldest uh, they um, they actually went through dual enrollment through the University of Texas, but it was research beforehand. We wanted to know if that they were going to take it at the university that they were going to attend. And uh, similar to um, some of the folks in the chat that mentioned that uh, they came in and they were already considered close to sophomores and were able to graduate a year early because of that. So therefore, it's a cost saving and time saving sometimes when you can do the AP exams and. And you can do the dual enrollment. So it's definitely something to consider while your children are in, in high school. Uh, yes, go ahead and I see a, a hand raised. You can open open your mic. Thank you. Um, can you please speak about letter recommendations? Um, unfortunately, of course, I have twin boys. Everyone is asking for letter recommendations. They are teachers that say they are at their limit. Um, some of the people I've asked that my boys have done volunteer work says, well, we don't really know them academically. Um, so that's the only reason we can't give out letter recommendation. I thought letters of recommendation to me have been really an insane experience. Um, to me, 
I mean, you could always go back and ask, re-ask, but I know, like I keep saying, universities want to say that you can be a well-rounded individual. So not necessarily does it have to say, oh, these students are going to put their best effort forward because of X, Y, and Z in my class, but also, you know, you can speak on, yes, they're hardworking individuals. Yes, um, you know, they're assigned a task, they're gonna get it done. Um, it's those soft skills that at the end of the day also go a long way. Um, I'm trying to think, I went to a smaller high school, so our letter of recommendations weren't um, a huge problem for us because our principal knew us directly, um, but also reaching out to like leaders of the community, people that you've worked with. Um, I'm trying to think of who else, I'm kind of drawing a blank here on this one, I'm sorry. But yeah, typically I, I went to a lot of my teachers. I got one from our principal and then I had volunteered at, um, at our school. They had like an off program to volunteer. The leader for that, I had asked him to write me a letter of recommendation. Also coaches and or um, yeah, school counselors um, and that I just put in the chat, but uh, our my coach wrote me a letter of recommendation um, kind of stating on like, yes, this person can be a leader. This person shows up on time. This person, um, they're good. You know, if you give them a task, they're going to be there for it. Um, but also, I guess, leaders around the community as well. If you have anything to add to that, Jocelyn. I do. I find it very strange because um, when I ask to even now, like I ask letters from my professors, like they even ask me, like I can only I, I can only talk beyond your academics or I always have a professor like, oh, I can't really talk about your academics, but I can talk about the fact that, you know, you run the student body um, from the engineering department or things like that. Right. Um, I guess it is a tough situation because um you run out of options of who to ask. And um, for me, when that happens, I usually, you know, reach out to a mentor that I've, someone that I've been talking to, like, hey, you know, I have this application, but my professor said he can't do it. Or, you know, I guess I try to, you know, have a list of, of people that I can count on or like I can reach out to, whether it's like, you know, my school counselor or my teacher specialist or what's our mentor or another professor, even though I'm not like, or in terms of whether it's like in the sports, if I'm doing sports or if I'm, you know, um, I guess how to go about it, whether it's like an after school program that can maybe talk about, um, you know, the student, or I guess in terms of like, if they can't really speak in academics, I don't think that should be a problem because most of the time um, when I apply to stuff, like I usually, you know, um, use my advisor for or the, our club advisor for some of those letters so I don't think it should be a problem but that's the first time that like I've heard something like that but um there should be able to I guess if they can't really talk about the academics but they can talk about the aspect of how the child or the student I guess you could say is volunteering so I guess finding or it can even be a family friend that could you know um, you can even ask in advance, like, oh, can a family friend write a letter, you know, for my child or, you know, student, I guess you could say, or even, um, I guess it, it it's kind of hard, kind of, I guess, in a sense, but um, also has to do with, you know, um, the fact of um, how you ask, because maybe they're swamped, too, because I've noticed that, like, some of my professors, when it comes to um asking them like I have to let them know three months in advance or I have to let them know like two months or something like that it just depends on the time frame or if there's or if I guess asking early and you know the worst thing they can say is no at least you already asked and you keep on going and you ask the next person I guess the the goal is to don't lose hope yeah and uh, for this, I'll give you like a dad perspective on this because I've actually been through it and uh, my children went through a a massive high school. It was like four or five thousand students. So um, this is always a challenge with the with the letter, especially with our teachers. Um, the first thing I, I would advise you is do some prep work in the sense like you want to create like a sheet a sheet about me. So like uh, of your student, what are their aspirations? What are their goals? Who they are? What are their GPA? Um, what 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 do they do? What about what what extracurriculars? That way, it's prep for the for the teacher or the person doing it. Like, okay, this is my student. Then you want 
for for teachers especially, you really want to uh, approach them before a break. Usually, my re recommendation for for uh, students is like that summer, that summer between junior and senior year, you really want to give them that about me. That's the time they have time to sit down and really write those letters. However, at this point, if you have a senior and you would remember 17 and 18, it's a little bit um, awkward and you don't want to be rejected. And um, there's some great opportunities coming with Thanksgiving break and, and Christmas break. So it's a wonderful time for you to find out what's the teacher's favorite chocolate and have the letter, uh, the all about me one pager and maybe write a nice little note like, dear Mr. So-and-so, I really enjoyed your class. I've really enjoyed your program. I would really appreciate if during the break, maybe you could provide me with the letter. Um, here is my email. Here's my cell phone. If you want to contact me, get more information because during these times, during these breaks, usually it's a good time um, and honestly, as an educator, I can tell you from my perspective, having been an educator for 20 years, you want to see your students succeed. And when you see that little note saying that, hey, I really need your help, it's going to be hard for you during Thanksgiving break or Christmas break not to write a letter for them. So that's a dad perspective on it. And I think, Rose, you have a question. Yeah, I was just going to speak up really quick. So I've worked in, before SHIP, I worked in high schools for um, a very long time. And I was even a college counselor for a time. Um, I was just going to say that senior teachers tend to get bombarded. So do jun junior teachers. But think about those teachers that your students still have connections with that they might have had earlier on. I know for my own students that have already graduated high school, um, my daughter in particular, she was super, super close with her freshman science teacher. Um, even though she didn't have that teacher since her uh, freshman year, um, she used to go in and help out, you know, um, help out after school, set up experiments, you know, just to her, it was just fun waiting for me to get out of work and her um, finding time, uh, a good way to spend her time in the classroom. So that was a great teacher for her to make a recommendation, like talk about how she was as an early student, but also the relationship that she was able to maintain over the next few years. So kind of think beyond your scene senior and sophomore teacher well I mean junior and I'm glad you brought that up Rose also because think of outside the box because remember what the purpose of the letters is to really talk about academics and talk about character so for example I I run a large volunteer um uh program here with with the with the food bank and where we deliver um twice a month a lot of uh, groceries to families and obviously for that, I give volunteers. Many times it's volunteers that are high school students. So many a times, even though I don't necessarily know them academically, I've written many letters speaking to like their work ethic, how they're always here on time. And then uh, if you have that one pager of all about me, it's very easy for someone, someone that they work with to write a letter and speak to the areas of the character that they do know about, even though it might not be academic. Great, great question. Other questions? I think we have time for like one more question. If not, going once, going twice. All right, so let's keep on going. I think Let's we have we're going to jump into the third part of our presentation, which will be um, discussing about actually applying to college. So let me. This is a good time while I'm having resolving tech. If you need 30 seconds, go grab something to drink, get some water, get some coffee. Well, she's got to for coffee. Thank you very much, panel, for sharing your insights and your knowledge. We really, really appreciate you. Okay, so let's jump on in. Applying to college. So this is a question for the group. Why is parent involvement important while students are applying to college? Okay. Go ahead and drop your thoughts in the chat. 
And I'm going to go ahead and open this up to Rose. Why do you think parent involvement is important while students are applying to college? Um, thanks for the question. So I think that, um, you know, it, it's a lot of a really big decision for such a young person. You know, we in our country, we tend to think that 18 year olds are adults and ready to like be on their own and they know they have all their stuff together. But in reality, I think, um, you know, having gone through this twice already as a mom, um, I think it's just really important for our students to feel that we're still supporting them, that we're not necessarily like just pushing them out of the nest, so to speak, without any support whatsoever. Um, and even if your student is very decisive on their own and know exactly what they want, I think, you know, being there to ask some of the questions they might not have thought of is always a really good exercise to do. And um, also just really helps keep that relationship of open communication there um, as they're making this big transition and knowing that it's okay to come back home to ask for help. It's okay to ask their parents things that they might not know. Um, we do have a series called Equipando Padres University, which focuses on, um, you know, parent support during the college years. And so there's um, a lot of research out there that helps us know that the more support that a student feels from home, from their friend groups, from their professors, the more likely they are to succeed. So I think the main takeaway for me is the parent involvement is really important for um, maintaining that relationship with your student, making sure that they're not feeling like they're just getting pushed out or that they're going into this next chapter completely on their own. Love it, love it, love it. And I see some amazing comments here in the chat about it's it's tricky because I think uh, I like what um, Susanna was saying and Melissa are saying uh, here about like you're walking this balance of making sure that they understand that they you have, they have the full support, but also like they're also making that transition to adulthood and taking control of their future. So how do you create that balance? And I think that's why it's so important because really this applying to college is usually like that first uh, decision that you're starting to make in the transition to adulthood. And um, I think having that parent by your side to make that decision, I think it's critical and it, it will speak volumes to what the future of that relationship looks like. Awesome stuff. Okay. So here, the next few minutes, it's going to be a lot of information. I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you this ahead of time. Don't feel like you need to capture it all. Um, the, we're gonna we're gonna have we're gonna go over. I, even even myself, who've been doing this for a few years, I still get confused with some of this stuff. All these because you're going to get into more technical aspects of of college entrance. So the learning objectives here for the next part is actually. We're going to talk about entrance exam, admission requirements, um, and application support. So as we dig in, that's really what we're trying to accomplish here in the next few minutes. Um, in my in advice, usually when parents do come to me and say, "Hey, how do, how do I get? I want my student to go through college. How do I how do I get them started? What path do I send them to uh, send them through?" I really encourage them to get look at these four areas as a place to start. Obviously, focus on your academics. Um, if you can be a good uh, a good student in those core, especially in those core classes and all, and then separate it into your extracurriculars and electives, making sure you have a strong foundation there in high school. And then getting involved. Uh, more and more as um, time has progressed, I feel like there's more of an emphasis on that community service, those um, that uh, I think Cassandra was speaking to those leadership opportunities within different uh, different areas. And then also those education, educator relationships. Um, many times as we were talking about with the letters of reference, um, recommendations, having that relationship with different teachers will really help out and just different folks, honestly, that you're getting involved with. Um, and finally, if you're looking into the STEM, what are those STEM extracurriculars? Now more and more, I'm seeing that 
at times when you're going through a STEM career, you're going to add like supplementals to STEM, like research projects and other areas. So what is it, what, what extracurriculars are involved with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that you can add to your application and also be involved in through high school to give you a better sense of what that field looks like? So let's talk about uh, entrance exams. So usually our entrance exams are two big ones are the SAT and ACT. They're standardized. And as you can see right there, that's kind of what they measure. Um, for the ACT, the different being that it also it does measure uh, science. But do keep in mind, um, and you've probably heard this in the news, if you give, like some, some colleges are not necessarily being requiring these anymore, but I still highly recommend any student that's considering applying to college to still take it. So that's something to consider. So obviously, if you're going to have standard exams, I always tell um, high school students, it's practice, practice, practice. I mean, m many of this is not, not only about the content, but it's the style of the exam. Um, it can get very confusing because it's a different way to get assessed. So uh, usually, uh, I would even go earlier than this, 8th, ninth and 10th grade, take the, those pre-SATs, pre-ACTs, that way you can be exposed to the to the actual exam. Also, keep in mind that sometimes when you do take these pre-SATs pre and pre-ACTs, that is already being used for scholarship applications, uh, special programs, uh, and merit scholarships. So that's why it's also very important to practice. Take the, the pre-ones, the pre-SAT and pre-ACT. And then the the actual exam usually, I I tell students that they, they really should take it at least twice. Um, and keeping in mind that there is a cost, but sometimes um, given your situation that can be waived or reduced, uh, but those are the costs currently for the exams themselves. So let's talk a little bit about admissions and selectivity. Um, so these are some of the areas that um, many of our colleges are looking for. If you can see in the bullets, it's going to be your admission statements, your interviews, your AP, your dual enrollment, your GPA, um, the a standardized assessment we talked about, the extracurricular and placement exams, also exams that measure you on specific contents to see what what level uh, to be you're being placed at the university level. The common app um, for many of our colleges, uh, one of the the new trends that well, it's not even that new, it's been happening for a while now, is where you have everything in one place. Through the common app, it it consolidates everything, and they can and you can use this application to apply to different uh, colleges. Uh, you can add the supplements that I was mentioning for for STEM. You can keep the up with your deadlines and what documents you have, um, and then it consolidates all your your essays, extracurriculars, all those little little different uh, aspects that we spoke of at the very beginning. Um, it can all be done through the common app. But also keep in mind that, that oh, actually this, this slide, non-common app schools. There are schools that don't are not necessarily in the common app. So it is important to keep that in mind because at times I know parents have said, oh, well, my, my child did do that the application, but not keeping in mind that maybe the school they're trying to uh, really eye in and targeting is not part of it. So it's important you to do your research on that. Um, before I dig into the next part, I'm gonna check to see if does anybody have questions on this first part before I move on. And let me check the chat just to make sure. Feel free to open the thing. Oh, thank you for dropping the links, Rose, in the chat. And okay, awesome. Let's keep on moving. So application costs. Um, 
depending on where where you're applying, usually the application for the university is going to be anywhere between thirty to seventy five dollars. At times, uh, if and I know many colleges and universities use the free and reduced lunch um, application that they do at a federal level. You can have fee waivers for for the applications, um, and then many universities offer free applications for STEM outreach programs. So again, I can't emphasize it enough, enough. It's important when you're actually looking at the university to really dig in and to see what they offer and what kind of programs, because each university is different um, and they all have their little intricacies within them. So on the admission process, this can be a little confusing. There's different types of admissions and you have the early action, early decision, and you have the early decision too, as well, regular decision and rolling. So what does this mean? So usually every, every school year, the common app goes live August 1st, and then you have your early decision, uh, period from October to November. Um, this is important to keep in mind that it's a binding decision. So usually what that happens is if you decide to go this route and take the early decision, you are committing to that school that, that you have it. This is really going to be uh, recommended for students uh, who have a clear direction and know that that's what, what they want to do. Um, but it is important to keep in mind that it is binding. Um, if you're trying to compare different schools, this might not be the best route to go just because of the binding situation. But for that, you can go into early action. Early action is non-binding. It's usually around the same time. And then with this one, you can actually explore different, different schools and compare financial packages. Um, Again, this this will give you a little bit more of a flexibility of not having to uh, commit necessarily to the school. And then you have your regular decision. Usually this happens January or February, the deadlines, and then you'll have a response in a couple of months. And finally, your rolling decisions. Okay, again, I'm going to take a quick uh, brief pause just to see if there's any questions. Check the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute. I know usually in these presentations, this is the module where I get a lot of questions. Uh, what I mean by binding, it's like you're committing. So uh, it's you're 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 making the commitment. Like if I uh, if you're attending University of Texas, for example, and you're going to and to um. It, and you and you decide that you're going to follow that action, then you're going to go ahead and and commit to them, and then therefore you don't you're not really exploring other schools. So that's why with this one, when you look at the difference, if you look at early decision right here, it says a binding decision and early action is non-binding. Great question. So. When you're thinking of the actual application, think about it as it's a it's you're really trying to paint a full picture of of uh, the whole profile of who the student is, who the, who your child is, and you do this through different in different ways. Like we were talking about letters of recommendation, letter of recommendation, they they carry a lot of weight because usually that's different perspective from people who have experience. Um, working with your your child in different areas or your student in different areas and um they they really speak volumes to that so i would highly recommend it along with that the essay um at times with the essay themselves that's that really is the chance for the student to it's not it's not i always say so you have to keep it authentic of who you are because what you really do want is clear, see, make it a clear picture to make sure that if it's going to be a right fit, uh, both ways, uh, the student for the college and the college for the student. So keeping that in mind, 
along with that, then you have a little bit more of the quantifiable stuff like the transcripts and GPA of what classes you took and what was a grade point average. Uh, all this together, when you do the full application, that creates a full picture of of the student and um, if if it's a it's if it's a right uh, uh, journey to take with that school. Here a little bit of what it, what what some of these things mean. Uh, the grade point average is an average of students' grade. Uh, you get boosted by uh, AP classes and honors courses, usually in high school. Um, and usually nine through twelve is a what well, nine through twelfth grade is what's considered an admissions that GPA. Um, it is very important. And I know sometimes it's very early because you're speaking about 14, 15 year olds, but for them to understand the impact at that age on their GPA, um, because sometimes when you're 14, 15, you're not keeping in mind that 18 is just across, like it's a blink away and, and that, that really not paying attention to those grades at the freshman year can really impact that GPA. So if you do have uh, children who are getting into high school, I can't put enough emphasis on the importance of uh, making sure they're they if they're they they if it's the right avenue to put them through AP classes, advanced coursework, and keeping that GPA strong early on. Usually, by the time it's junior and senior, if you're on that track, that's something you already know and you already have your eye on the prize. Again, letter recommend recommendations. I know we just had a long conversation about that. But it's important to foster foster those relationships early. Coaches, advisors, managers, teachers, organizational leaders, um, all kind of community leaders, uh, request with plenty of time. Um, there is always that senior rush, and as a teacher, you'll get every single student's request at the last second for them, and that it really creates. Uh, you put that teacher in a very bad situation because. You love your students, but you don't. If you say one to you, say yes to one. How can you say no to the other one? So it's very important to get those early and request them, especially like if you can catch them during a break. It would be awesome. Always, always, always make sure they have a personal email. Um, the school email does expire at sometimes. It's unfortunate that this it's they were expecting for very important messages from universities. Or sometimes they'd say, have you heard it from like financial packages and they use their school email and it's no longer there. So make sure that for everything, they already have a personal email, a professional personal email or a student professional personal email um, for, for their applications and everything that has to do with university. I was just going to note really quick um, on the uh, point that teachers get really busy, um, encourage your students to follow up with an email. Um, a lot of times kids ask while you're in the middle of something like, hey, can you write me a letter of rec? And you're like, oh, my gosh, I love this kid so much. I want to say yes. And then you forget because they asked you verbally. So make sure that your students are following up by email and written con um, once they get that uh, that yes. And just to follow up because teachers forget things often. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful tip, Rose. Yes, absolutely. I echo that. I can't echo that enough. Everything should be followed up through email. Um, so crafting college essays. This is a topic within itself that honestly could be a two-hour session by itself. But ultimately, it is a personal statement. Um, and it's of who the student is, who they currently are, who are their aspirations. Um, it is really, should really be very authentic. And I keep on saying that just because um, I find it that the more authentic it is, uh, it's better for, I mean, for the school and for the student to understand if they're a good fit. Uh, and if it, if there's, I, I think Cassandra was saying something like, oh yeah, once you're here, you 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 need, I don't whether it takes you a hundred years to finish, you are going to finish up what the parents said. I think that's a great attitude to have. But at the same time, like if it's not being authentic or you just get in there and it's not a right fit, it can be a very long four years. That's why it's important to make sure that it's 
everything that's presented is authentic and you will find the right place. I know that sometimes it's disheartening when students don't get into their first choice, but usually what I've noticed of talking to hundreds, if not thousands of people and professionals that everything does happen for a reason. And usually like they end up in a place that the place that they were supposed to be at. Um, from, from the parent perspective, I really, <laughs> it's very challenging as a parent because uh, again, they're going transition to adulthood, but it's very challenging because I know for me, I sometimes I want to take over and be like, oh, you should write this and write that because you know them best. But keep in mind that you're a support as a parent and you really should be helping with brainstorming ideas, uh, maybe with the narrative support and making those connections. But um, it is not our essay as a parent. So uh, make sure that the students really have uh, their, their, their voice in there. Extracurricular activities, um, this varies. It just really depends. It can be anything from sports to volunteer to even having a part-time job. Um, but always keeping in mind the quality uh, uh, the quality versus quantity of involvement. Um, again, I'll go back to something Cassandra said is but it, like if you can be in leadership roles within your extracurricular, that that speaks volumes. So that really is very strong. Um, and then having said that, how do you connect it back to it? Because at times I know that I've had um, students or parents saying like, oh, no, my child, like times are rough. So they have to work part time. OK, that's fine. But how do you that there there are things that you learn through that experience that you can connect back to the application of uh how the student is resilient and how they can manage and how that that would be something that that would be a positive in the application and the college experience so keeping that in mind so where can you find resources to support your child in applying to college I know we're getting pretty close on time. So I'm going to go ahead and give you a few tips on how you can help as a parent. I think it's important to keep in mind that usually when all this is taking place, it's, it's senior year in high school. And if you've been through senior year in high school, there is so much going on. There are the football games. There is homecoming. There is prom. There is a Christmas break. There are uh, the friendships, relationships, and everything between. There are jobs. There are socials. So as a parent, my recommendation to do is, one, making sure that you can help them stay focused. And if you can help them make sure that they keep a record of deadlines. I like to start a binder personally with my own kids. Like this is where we're getting to. This is our wonderful binder of your first four years of adulthood. So uh, what are all the deadlines that we're going to have? Have different tabs. All the universities you put in, it, it, all, all the universities you're considering in one tab, all the deadlines you have, all the financials, your scholarships you're going to apply to. So I think all this being said, I think as a parent, my biggest recommendation to you would be just helping them stay organized and on track for this part of their lives, which we all know it's going to be huge when they turn 18 to 19 years old. But when you're 17 and 18 in senior years, at times, some they cannot, it's, they don't consider it as a huge part of their life, even though we know how important it is. So helping them with tracking all that is, it would be probably my biggest uh, recommendation for you as a parent. And then being willing to learn, like, I know every single one of my my kids that I've helped um, I, I, in this college process, I've learned a lot about them and I've learned a lot about the process. So uh, it's very important to come in with the open mind and and really listen to to uh, what what our, our children are saying that they want their future to look like and what, what are their wants, what are their needs. And then hopefully being able to take that and translate it into how to showcase that into their application. So 
Keep that open dialogue. Okay. At this time, I am going to go ahead and open it for questions because I know we covered quite a bit in a very short amount of time. So are there any questions from our parents? And while I open this, I also want to invite you, as you can see here, there's a QR code for a survey for this module. Um, one of our, the whole purpose of all of us being here, why we exist is to add value to you as a parent. So if you can go ahead and give us a little bit of your feedback on how we can be better or or what we can do, we would really appreciate it. So take a few minutes. And at this time, it is also time for questions. Let me see if there are any questions on the chat. There are, the links are also in the chat. When do you apply to FAFSA or will there be a workshop? There already be a workshop. Actually, the financials, if I'm in Rose, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's our next workshop the where we talk about uh, paying for college. Uh, I believe so. And I be so uh, to answer your question, I think somebody asked me in the ch chat, there will be a, there is a complete module there where we talk just about financials, scholarships and grants and all that, how to pay for school. And I'm 99% sure it's our next module. So stay tuned and make sure you come back. Um, any other questions? Feel free to open the mic. Everybody should have received um, or, or should receive swag and the guidebook. If, if you run into an issue with that, make sure that you... Uh, talk to uh, Rose, get in touch with Rose for that information. Uh, actually, here it is. You join us next time for paying for college. So, yes, yeah, so whoever asked that question about financials, join us next time for paying for college. So we will be doing a raffle for a scholarship. You must be present to win. And if you have any further questions, this is an email you can send them to, but it's at ship.org. And all right, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put it back on the survey. Just got a direct message. Somebody going to get it. Perfect. Okay, y'all. Uh, let me see. I think I got something here. Group photo. Group photo. Okay. If everybody can turn on their camera. Uh, Melissa, I see your message. Rose, do you know the answer to the message? About... Um, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, the survey is different after every session so once you click on the today's date then it'll bring you to a different set of questions um according to the content that we learned this month so the link is the same but the questions should be different oh it's because i scanned the code on my phone and that's what popped up so once i scanned the code the qr code on my phone with like my camera i clicked on the little link that shows on the on the bottom like the yellow one and when the page opens up, it says you've already taken this survey. It didn't give me any options. There's no back. There's It just pulled up, that up. Should I just do it on the computer? Try good maybe? to know. Um, yes, there's also the link in the chat that should work. Um, I haven't heard of that happening. So maybe the only other thing I can think of is close out of your browser and try again. But okay. it should work on the computer. Okay, I'll just do the link. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. All right, Rose, you taking a group photo? Okay, let me see. Get my computer ready. Make sure I can see everybody. Let me comb my hair real quick. I'm getting a cold. <laughs> Mm 
Tell us when, Rose. Uh-oh, Jose, your eyes are closed. We'll do it again. Three, <laughs> two, one. Looks good. Thank you, everyone. All right, folks. So at this time, we will stop the recording. Are we doing the raffle? Oh, are we? Is that? Um, we should be doing the raffle. Was there not a a slide for that? Let me just save this. Hold on, really quick. Hold on! Don't leave! Don't leave! There might be some goodies. Um, I'm sorry. I don't. Maybe this was on me. <laughs> uh, let me get that really quick. You want me to stop sharing? You can stop sharing. I just got the. <clears throat> And you're very welcome. We're here to serve. So uh, thank you for all the nice comments on the chat. So for our attendance taker, if it's a green block, does that mean that they're present? Maybe they come off mute. All right, I can check. Okay, here we go. Is she also on y'all's end? Okay. Um, would would you want me to try to do the like the raffle generator really quick? Please, Andrea, if you can. Yes, give me one quick minute. Did you guys see the name of wheels? The wheel of names. <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. All of a sudden it said you had no internet and like kicked me out. I have no idea what just happened. Um all right, so we'll start again. Sorry okay. about that. Thanks, parents, for hanging out. Oh, there you go. How do we do this? Oh, just click it again. Okay. The winner is drum roll, everyone. Brandon, we have a winner. So I just want to make sure that I have your email address. And I do. So um, thanks for staying on. <laughs> Sorry for the delay and the crazy getting kicked out right when the wheel was spinning. But um, have a good night, everybody. And Brandon uh, will be sending you an email here in the next, well, probably tomorrow one. And so, I'll, we'll hang out for a few minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to s stick around. I'll be happy to answer them one-on-one. -on -one. Congrats, Brandon. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everybody. Am I still sharing? <laughs>